Well, good morning, friends, and welcome to River Church Online Worship. Uh, I'm here in our worship space, and we'll be worshiping here in person in just a few hours, but, but we're continuing to make these, these videos uh, because we know that some of you, you can't yet join us. You're not yet ready to get out, and we want to make you a part of the body of Christ, the church, uh, even while you're away. And so this is the best way, can, the way that we can worship together is, is virtually. So, so I, I'm, just, I'm honored that you have invited me into your home this morning. Let's get ready to worship together. Uh, what that probably means is you're going to get rid of some distractions, go get your Bible, something to write with, something to write on, uh, maybe fill up your coffee cup. Uh, by the way, if there's anything you need to know about River Church that you don't already know, you can go to our website, riverchurchrgv.com, and all things River Church can be found there. All right, well, let's get ready to worship in just a few minutes. Well, good morning and welcome to our latest installment of our sermon series, The Great Exchange. Uh, as you know, we're walking through the Bible this year and we're looking for this central theme in each and every story of the Bible, on each and every page of the Bible. The theme is the great exchange, which is a phrase that I use to describe how God interacts with humanity throughout the history of the Bible. He, he exchanges something for something else, and we'll talk more about that later. But the specific big idea or theme that I want us to explore today is, might it be possible that God would take the former years of your life, which maybe you see as wasted, and trade it for something great, big, and awesome in your life story? Or, or might he take something about you that's unique and maybe you consider insignificant? Might he take that unique aspect of who you are and trade it or use it for some bigger, grander purpose? We're looking for that in the story Today, in the book of Exodus, I'll give you an example. Quite a few years ago, when I was a much younger man, Lydia and I just had small kids at the time. We didn't even have, uh, we only had three of the five kids that we now have. And it was a significant t time in our lives because I almost, almost got a new job. And we almost moved all the way across the country for this job that I almost got. And in the 11th hour, it turned out that I didn't get the job. And to be honest with you, I was really disappointed. And a significant person in my life, a significant person in that decision-making process said to me, Randy, my prayer for you is that in five years, you'll be glad that you didn't get this job and you'll be glad that you didn't move across the country. Well, that didn't help much. I was super disappointed, but do you know that five years later, I had moved back to South Texas? I had begun this, this awesome journey of, of planting River Church. And I was honestly overjoyed that I had not taken that job, that I had not received that job. And so it was a major disappointment in my life. I'll, I'll tell you the story sometime if you want to hear it. It was a major disappointment in my life, but it actually turned out to be a real blessing. Does God take things in our lives, even disappointments, insignificant, quirky aspects of who we are, former years that we thought wasted, does he take those things and, and make them for good? And that's what we're talking about today. Now, if we are to believe that God takes our younger years, those years that we thought perhaps wasted, or if he takes some unique aspect of who we are, something that maybe we see, we consider insignificant, that he takes those things and he makes them for good. He redeems them and makes them a part of our life story in a beautiful way. If we're to believe that, then we are compelled to believe that God looks down on the, the quirky, sometimes wasted aspects of our life, and he, he notices, he, he knows. That's a theme throughout the Bible, that, that God looks down on his children and he knows. It's one of my favorite phrases in the Bible, that God looks down and he, he knows. We know that because in the, in the book of Exodus, it tells us that God looked down on the suffering of his children, the Hebrew people, and he determined it's time to take action. 
he looked down and he, quote, knew. He just knew it's time to, it's time to do something about this. Exodus chapter 2, verses 23 and 24 says, During those many days, the king of Egypt uh, during those many days, the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and they cried out for help and their cry for rescue uh, from slavery, uh, it came up to God. And God heard their groaning and God remembered his, his covenant, his promise with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob. God uh, said to the people, saw the people of Israel and God knew. I love that phrase. And this is true of your life as well. He, he, he looks down on you, your trouble, uh, your, your difficulty, and, and he just, he knows. He gets it. He understands. Today we're going to look at a, a young fellow in the Bible who uh, kind of grew up in the book of Exodus into a man, uh, a, young, a young man by the name of Bezalel. And in this story today, he's, he's, painting, he's painting pomegranates and he's, he's forming different like clay and, and different, different three-dimensional products into pomegranates. And, and, and he's, he's living in the tent in Egypt as a slave boy and, 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 and nobody got him. He's an artist and nobody understands him. And in fact, he didn't quite get himself yet either. He, did, he didn't even quite understand why he, as a young slave boy, enjoyed art. Like, why am I different than everybody else? He didn't understand, but, but God knew. God knew. Exodus 31. This is way fast forwarding into um, young Bezalel's life. Fast forwarding now, he's, he's not so young anymore. It says, The Lord said to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, son of Ur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, with knowledge and all craftsmanship, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, and in carving wood to work in every craft. And behold, I have appoint, appointed with him Oholiab, the son of Asi, uh, Ahisamach of the tribe of Dan. And I, have given to, uh, and I have given to all able men ability that they may make all that I have commanded you, the, the tent of meeting, the, the ark of testimony, the mercy seat that is on it, and all the furnishings of the tent, the table, its utensils, pure lampstand with its utensils, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils, and the basin and its stand, and the finely worked garments, the holy garments for Aaron the priest and the garments of his sons for their services as priests, and the anointing oil and the fragrant incense for the holy place according to all that I have commanded you they shall do. Okay, what's going on here? A lot of words. What's going on is God is giving Moses this intricate description of how the tabernacle, their first place of worship, how it's going to be designed. Now, now think on this. The, the nation of Israel, the Hebrews, they just left Egypt. They're now out in the wilderness. They're traveling. They've never been a people group. They've never been a nation before. They've never had this religion uh, with, with, its, with its practices and its habits and its traditions. They've never had that before. They've never had a place to worship before. And now God is giving them this, this tent. This, it's, it's, it's actually a large tabernacle. It's going to be able to move because they're nomadic people, but it's, it's, their, it's their church building. And he's giving them Aaron and his sons as their priests. And they have these elaborate um, outfits that they're to wear. And in the tabernacle, there's an altar and there are tables of incense and there, there are candlesticks and there's the Ark of the Covenant and there's all this beautiful stuff that they're going to, it's going to become a rich part of their tradition, their history as worshipers. And, and, and but what, what, what I, you may have missed, what, what's so significant about the beginning of this, this reading today is that that God says, I have called by name Bezalel. And I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with ability and intelligence, knowledge and craftsmanship to devise 
artistic design. He's going to be the, the art director for this, this elaborate build-out of the tabernacle. And, 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 and it says that God called him by name and filled him with the Spirit of God. Why? To be an artist. To make art. He called him by name. Now, when do you think that process began? What I'm proposing is that, that way back years earlier in Egypt, when he was a slave boy, Perhaps Bezalel was, was that weird kid who, who liked to draw and paint and no one understood him. And he's got this, this, this weird preoccupation with, with pomegranates. I think we have a picture of pomegranates. Uh, they're really a beautiful, uh, I guess it's a fruit, a beautiful fruit. And it's, it, if we read all of, of, of God's uh, explanation of the, of the tabernacle. There are pomegranate paintings and, and three-dimensional pomegranates. Like the tabernacles has all these, these beautiful renditions of pomegranates. And, and so Bezalel, years earlier, was probably painting pom What is it with pomegranates, Bezalel? They would ask him. Now, I, I, listen, I, I've been around. <laughs> I'm a musician. I've been around artists all of my life. And I, I understand how this works. Bezalel was probably that kid. Like, he spent his formative years in slavery in a camp outside of town, outside of on the outskirts of Egypt, because that's where the Hebrews lived when they were slaves. That's how he grew up, outside of the camp, tending sheep because they were shepherds, perfecting the art of painting, painting pomegranates. And, and, I, and I, bet, I bet his buddy would say, Bees, Bees, man, why are you so weird? Oh, why do you paint? We live in slavery. We are going to die in slavery, bees. Why do you get on, why don't you get on the ball helping us with the hard work of being slaves? Forget your art. Slaves don't paint. And probably on that day, Bezalel's light grew a little dimmer in his soul. It flickered, but it didn't burn out. Why? Because the Lord knew. We're talking years before the, the tabernacle instructions had been given, and Bezalel's just a young slave boy, but the Lord knew. And so that little light inside of Bezalel, it flickered, but it did not burn out because the Lord knew. The Lord was watching. The Lord was cheering Bezalel on. You keep on painting. You keep on painting those pomegranates, son. One of these days, I'm going to need dozens of pomegranates. They're going to paint those things all over the new tabernacle. And you, you're the man for the job, Bezalel. You're just a little boy now, but you're a man, the man for the job. Isn't it? Funny, not really the right word. But isn't it funny what gets us through the difficult periods in our life? They might seem insignificant, maybe even a waste of time. What are you going through right now? I just, I just really believe, as your pastor, I just really believe, I believe enough in the sovereignty of God, the, the goodness of God, I believe enough in that to say with, with some God confidence that the Lord is preparing you for something. The Lord has been preparing you for something. You don't see it. I mean, maybe a few of you do, but, but most of you, you don't see it. And, and I, I can't predict it, but, but, but that's God. He knows. Maybe you're a middle-aged dude like me or even a little bit older. and the, the Lord's still writing the story of your life. And maybe you feel like it hadn't quite come together yet. Well, I got, I got some big ideas from this passage today, from the story of Bezalel. I just want you to consider how this might be true of you. Number one, the first big idea is this. The Lord has been working in your past. You may think it's been random. It's been terrible. Uh, it's been chaotic. But if God is who he says he is in the Bible, then the Lord has been working in your past. 
In fact, the Bible says that he knew you before anyone else knew you. That he knew you before you were even knit together in your mother's womb. And he's always had a plan for your life. The, the Lord is, has been working in your past. I want to tell you about a friend of mine. I, I've kind of lost track of him. We're not such good friends anymore, but not because I, I don't think the world of him. We just life got busy. But, but his name is Billy Crockett. He was a, he still is a big deal, but he was a big deal on the radio, oh, several decades ago. Like KVMV, if you ever listen to Christian music, Billy Crockett, years ago, was, was running with the likes of, of Rich Mullins. Even to this day, Billy Crockett continues to crank out really good music. Uh, he was, just in recent years, he, was, he opened the Kerrville Folk Festival's main stage. I think that was in 2017. I had him come when I was in Albuquerque, come and do a series of concerts in, in Albuquerque. And they were, they were just beautiful concerts. And he's a wonderful jazz guitarist and wonderful singer and a wonderful songwriter. And I just think the world of him is a musician. But, but listen to how his story got started. He was born in Guthrie, Oklahoma. Billy was an on-the-move Air Force brat until his family finally settled in Dallas when Billy was just six years old. He got his first guitar. It was a freebie that came with a set of tires at the age of 10. <laughs> now, I remember Billy telling me, Billy Crockett telling me that when he was a little boy, six, got his first cheap guitar with a set of tires and how he was just enamored by this guitar. He just couldn't put this guitar down. He played it all the time. His father would come home in the evenings, and his father was a piano player, self-taught jazz piano player, and they would, they would make a little music together. But, but, but his father would go back to work, and, and Billy just couldn't put the guitar down. Ultimately, it led him to jazz studies at the University of, of North Texas and a lifelong career in Christian music, in folk music, in jazz, he owns his own studio. But what stuck out to me was I remember, I remember one time asking uh, Billy about his, his Christian faith and his, um, his growing up years. And he told me, Randy, he said, in my younger years, in my teenage years in particular, I didn't so much love Jesus, but I really loved the guitar. He said, you know, Randy, as Jesus drew me to himself and began using me in Christian music, I began to realize that, that my love, my love for the guitar in my teenage years was something that God was, was working out, was, was doing in my life. I, I didn't love Jesus so much, but I loved the guitar. But God knew. God knew that, that he was going to use me a lifetime of good music. He was going to use me in that process and it was all going to begin in those formative years because God looked down and God knew. Oh, if we could all embrace that truth that the Lord, he's been working in your past. There's a second big idea. And that is the Lord has been preparing you for where you are today. He has brought you to this moment. Just like Bezalel. His friends told him, look, 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 Bees, slaves don't paint. Get back to the heavy lifting. Slaves don't paint. But when you fast forward to those tabernacle years, when they were building out this, this beautiful sanctuary, this beautiful, elaborate place of worship, Bezalel says, the Lord was working, and he's brought me to where I am today. Friends, wherever you are today, you may feel like you're in a dead-end job. You may feel like you have just maxed out in your potential. Maybe you feel like you're stuck in the mud. Maybe you feel like your relationship is going nowhere. What I want you to know, what I want you to believe, is that according to how God describes himself in the Bible, not only has he been working in your past, he has brought you to this moment right now for some purpose. The Lord has been preparing you for this 
very day, right where you are right now. Here's the last big idea I think we can draw from the story this morning. The Lord is doing something in you right now that is bigger than you realize and part of a bigger plan. You might say, yeah, you know, Randy, I'm not Bezalel. I'm not this great artist that's, you know, waiting to be, to be showcased. Or maybe you'd say, you know, Randy, I'm not, I'm not like Billy Crockett, you know, playing, on, playing my music on the radio and playing on the main stage at the uh, Kerrville Folk Music Festival. That's not me. And I would tell you that that's not me either. I'm not all that. Here's what I take joy in from this story. I don't know if you caught it or not, but when we read out of Exodus, it spoke of Bezalel and how he was filled with the spirit toward the working out of, the, of, the, of the, this art. But, but if, I don't know if you caught it or not, but, but as we continue to read, it said that there were dozens of other men and women who also were artists building the tabernacle of the Lord. And I'd say that's us, that's me, that's you. For every Bezalel, there are dozens or, or, or thousands of us, children of God who are, who are on God's mission. We are seeing the kingdom of God being built right before us. And God says, I, I've got a purpose for you. I, I've got a plan for you. I, I've brought you to this point because I've got a bigger plan than you can even realize. I, I've got this bigger plan. It's the building of the kingdom of the Lord. And, and I, I, I invite you. He says, I invite you in. The Lord says, child, I, I have a plan for your life. So I ask you this morning, can you embrace that? Can you embrace the possible truth that, that, that God wants to take those formative years, those those seemingly wasted years. The God wants to take something about you that you would say, yeah, it's unique, it's quirky, but it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of insignificant. Whatever it is, whatever it is you got going on in your life, can, can, can you dare to dream? Can you dare to believe that God wants to take that? In this great exchange, he wants to take that and make it for good. Redeem it and use it for his kingdom. Use it for his grand plan. Could that be true? Right where you are in life right now, you may think like some things got to change in order for me to be used by the Lord. Don't you think Bezalel probably thought that as well? The Lord wants to take whatever it is that you think maybe is wasted, that you maybe think is insignificant. He wants to use it in his grand plan. Can you embrace that, dear friend? The great exchange. Let's close with just a deep understanding of what God has already done in our lives. The great exchange. It's all over the Bible. It's in today's story as well in the life of Bezalel. The great exchange goes like this. God wants to take our sinful brokenness, our, our fractured lives. He wants to take that. Take it off our hands. Take it off our shoulders and and in its place, he wants to put the righteousness of Christ. I'll end with the passage today that I normally start with, and that is 2 Corinthians 5. This is the great exchange of the Bible. This is where it all gets started for us. 2 Corinthians 5, it says, For our sake God made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's the great exchange. If you're broken, if, 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 you're, if you're a misfit, if you're fractured, if you've got a bad reputation, if you feel like just an awkward outcast, the plan of the Lord is to, to take your sinfulness, to take your brokenness, and to place that on Christ. That's what he did on the cross. And all that, all that shame and, and all that sin and, and all that entire debt of sin that, that, that you've been carrying around, was, that was nailed to the cross. 
Jesus didn't, he didn't, he didn't own that. He didn't deserve that, rather. We, I amassed the debt of sin, but, but he took it. He took it on the cross so, so that I, it could be taken off my, my back. And I now no longer owe that sin of debt. But, and in its place, in its place, God placed on me, put on me the righteousness of Christ. So God now sees you through that lens. You are the righteousness of Christ. Embrace that. Rest in that. If God is willing and able to do that, that grand thing of, of, of trading your sins out for Christ's righteousness, if he's able to do that great big thing, don't you think he is more than able to make good on every other promise that he has made in the Bible? He doesn't just want to redeem you from, from hell. He wants to give you a new life. A new adventure. He has, he has some grand plan for you. Embrace that. Begin asking him, God, God, show me. What it is? What is it here in Brownsville, Texas in 2021? I feel like maybe I'm wasting my life. God, what is this plan that you have for me? Ask him and he will tell you. Love you guys. Friends, there's this phrase that, that sometimes we use and it's kind of sappy. It says, you got to stop and smell the roses, you know, and I, I've been trying to think of a better phrase to use this week and I, I just, I don't know, it's sappy, but it, it works, right? Uh, if you are wrestling with this issue today, like what is the purpose of my life? You know, Pastor Randy talked today about how God wants to redeem my life and use it for his good purposes. What does that look like? Well, I invite you today, maybe to go on a little walk. It's kind of cold outside, I know. Maybe go for a little walk. I mean, just take some time and make yourself a cup of, of hot tea and sit down and just say, Lord, would you speak to me? What is it that you are, are, are doing in my life? Lord, Pastor Randy said today that, that you look down on my life and you know. You know what I'm going through. You, you know what I've been through. You, you sympathize with me. God, what is it you're doing in my life? I'm going to go out on a limb here and say, I promise if you will sincerely ask the Lord, he will speak to you. It's going to be in silence, most likely. It's going to be just in your spirit. But, but if, you'll, if you'll ask the Lord, he really, he tells us, he will communicate. He will talk to you. Stop. Smell the roses. <laughs> If you're dissatisfied with life, if you're frustrated with where you are, if you wonder if, any, if, if your life has any purpose at all, ask the Lord. He knows. He knows you. He's looking down on you. He sympathizes with you. He wants to communicate with you. Ask the Lord. Well, friends, it's been good to be with you today. Um, I, want you to, I want you to take some time today and ask these questions. I also encourage you if, you, if you have any questions maybe that you want to ask me, uh, you can go to our website. You can send me an email, uh, randy at riverchurchrgv.com. If there's a way that I, that, that, that we as your elders can serve you, just let me know. If there's a way that we can pray for you, let me know. If there's a way that we can serve you, let me know. Um, now would be a good time to, to go on the website and, and give. Uh, it's safe, intuitive, it's quick, easy. Um, Go to the website and click the giving button. It's how we pay for all the ministry that, that goes on here. And so you have been giving, and I thank you for that. And that's why we've continued to be able to keep the doors open. All right, friends. Well, I do love you. I, I miss those of you that haven't, been, haven't come back yet. I do miss seeing you. I look forward to seeing you soon. I see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, but for now, uh, this is what we got. And, and so, again, I'm, I'm honored that you invite me into your home every week. You enjoy the rest of your day. Love you.